We live in an information-driven society where we see the proliferation of self-driving cars, AI and cloud computing. When you use the internet, you access an infinite amount of information, much more than you could ever find in a library. Our society is so advanced that we can record any small event that happens in our lives, such as the millions of pictures and videos we take and store in the cloud. But what is the cloud? All of this information must be stored somewhere, and it is stored in huge buildings called data centres. Data centres are made by millions of tiny components, which are constantly performing millions of operations to store and process the data. To write the information into data centres, we use a two-letter alphabet made by the digits 0 and 1, which are basic units, or bits. Files and programs consist of millions of these bits. A sequence of bits is the way to represent text, images, and all sorts of other data. Information and Communication Technologies, or ICT, accounts for nearly 10% of electricity consumption, and this is rapidly increasing. Artificial intelligence is also significantly increasing the growth in data processing. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is the science of training machines to move towards imitating the human brain. It has been enabled by a huge explosion in CPU power. It requires the crunching of training of massive amounts of data. Data is growing exponentially. Around 2.2 billion gigabytes of data are created in the world every day. In 2016, 90% of the world's data ever created had been done so in the two previous years. The world's data centers use one terawatt hour of energy per day. This is the equivalent to the electricity from 1 million wind turbines or 20 nuclear power stations. Considering how quickly AI is growing, it's predicted to consume one-fifth of the world's power by 2025, and within just a few years, hundreds of new nuclear power stations will be required to fuel this growth. Even some developed countries will not have sufficient power to sustain this growth. Writing and reading words, along with transferring the data from a memory unit to a logic unit, takes up energy. Although this energy is not so much itself, if you multiply it by the number of accesses that are made in every second, you can understand why data centers are among the world's main energy eaters. So far, we have kept feeding data centers with all the energy they need, but this is becoming too much. We need to think of alternatives. New pushes from science are needed to develop prototypes that will help break through this bottleneck. For in-memory computing, there is one unique device that both stores and processes the information and we avoid the information being transferred between a memory and logic unit. This can save huge amounts of energy and helps by speeding things up too. Scientists are focusing on creating such devices in several ways. Resistive switching devices, called MEM resistors, are special types of memory device, switching between low and high resistance states to represent the logical zero and one. The MEM resistor technology has some important advantages over competing technologies in terms of density, cost, switching speed and compatibility with existing circuit designs. They can be used to create a brain-like structure where a dense crossbar array of MEM resistor elements can mimic the parallel architectures of the brain, connecting a myriad of low-power computing elements and adaptive memory elements. For AI, this would mean speed, training ability and efficiency would be significantly improved. Non-volatile memory-based technology, using MEM resistors, could be game-changing for both resistive memory applications and neuromorphic computing. Importantly, in MEM resistors, the resistance state can be programmed and subsequently remain stored, even when the power is removed. But how does a MEM resistor work? The change in resistance happens when the structural changes in the material of the device facilitate or prevent the motion of electrons throughout the device. In order to use our MEM resistors in computers, they have to be able to switch millions and millions of times without breaking. But this high endurance has not yet been achieved. Here at the University of Cambridge, at the Department of Material Science, we use nanotechnology to focus light inside these devices. And we can actually confine light in areas which are very small, something like a billionth of a meter wide, which is something like a thousand times smaller than the size of a human hair. 
The strange physics of light interacting with matter on the nanoscale allows us to characterize these devices in real time, where their functioning depends on how the material behaves in a space just a few atoms across. This way, we can understand how these devices break, for example, and this allows us to improve their performances, their endurance, and in general, opens up a lot of new opportunities for their application in real life and real technology. Another type of memory technology is magnetic RAMs, or MRAMs. In an MRAM, the bits 0 and 1 are simply the orientation of a tiny magnet with respect to a fixed reference one. To write a bit, we have to apply a magnetic field, but since it is difficult to confine the magnetic field lines to tiny volumes, we have to keep the bits far away to avoid contaminating nearby ones. This is easily solved by quantum physics that gave us new ways to switch the magnets by passing current directly through them, and currents can be made more localised to the bit area. The good thing about magnetic bits is that once you write them, they stay unchanged for years and years. So, unless we want to change the information stored in them, we only need to write them once. This makes magnetic memories intrinsically energy friendly. The problem with them is that they are just too slow, and if we relied exclusively on them to store our data, our computers and mobile phones would also be too slow. Here at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Physics, we're finding ways to switch and read magnets at ultra fast speeds. And this means 1,000 billionth of a second. Although pretty fast, electrical currents cannot cope with such speeds and we need to rely on the fastest thing we know in nature, which is light. So at the Maxwell Center, in our ultra-fast Pintronics lab, we take light from a very powerful laser and use it to write and read magnets as fast as we possibly can. To make the devices, we've got to have atoms all coming together in a perfect arrangement, all completely flat, just like bubbles in a bath. Well, that's not easy with atoms, real atoms. So what we need to do is create an environment in a vacuum chamber with lasers to help to create those arrangements of atoms which come together and then condense on a substrate. This vapour contains atoms arranged in a very disordered way, but when it condenses onto the substrate to form a film, it creates a very ordered crystalline solid from a disordered array of atoms. In this layer, we fit atoms together like billiard balls. We don't want any missing atoms or atoms shifted from regular anchoring points. So we have to get billions of atoms coming together to create this perfect arrangement. But of course, that's not a made-to-measure approach. We need to have a bespoke approach. And that's what we can do in our material science department with our chambers. We can create really perfect arrangements of billions of atoms. Not 100% perfect, but nearly there.